So today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue where we left off last time. That is, we're going to look at some examples of uh, digital. I'm not going to use Boolean anymore. I'm going to use digital logic functions. This is basically sections 2.1 to 2.3, but we're also going to start chapter 3, which is the most difficult, in my opinion, one-eighth of the course. Because you need this for lab next week, and it's better if we get through this part about basically physical realization of logic using transistors before we get into the lab. So let's just do that. But before we get started, do you have any questions we've done so far? If no questions, let's look at section 2.1 and recall that we were basically talking about logic functions. So recall our friend, the NOT gate. So if this is X, this is Y. Again, this has power supplies, which you will see in lab uh, tomorrow. VCCVE, not tomorrow, sorry, what am I saying? Next week, Saturday. So I'm not going to draw the power supplies out anymore because it just makes it very messy. So this was our not gate, if you will, that is x, y, 0, 1, 1, 0. That's the, you could say this is the, they call it the truth table, okay? because if 1 is true, 0 is false, it's, it's a bunch of true and false values, what the function does. Whoops. Let's go there. Okay. So this is like listing out what your function does. Okay, except if you have a, like a real function, y equals x squared, you'll have an infinite number of entries. Here you have only a finite number of entries. And mathematically, so this is a schematic symbol okay, of a NOT gate. Like you have a schematic symbol for a resistor. You have one for a NOT gate. And the mathematical expression, I forgot, there are, there are two main expressions or notations. I forgot which one your book uses. There is y equals x bar or y equals x with an, whatever, an apostrophe. I'll use either of these interchangeably. Right? I think your book uses the first one. I'm not sure. Okay. doesn't matter. It's notation. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, this is what I wanted to mention. In lab, next week, you'll be using what is called as a 74HC. HC stands for high speed CMOS. We'll talk about it later next week before lab. I see, I believe this is a hex inverter. That is, there are six um, inverters in one chip. And you can Google search and find what is called as the data sheet, which gives you all the information on this 74HC04. Yeah, hex inverter. So here is like, Let's just look at the data sheet itself. This is a, the data sheet is a very vital component of how you understand how you understand device functionality. So basically, this is what the chip looks like. Uh, this is a particular packaging. We'll use um, we won't use this packaging. We'll use something called uh, DIP. This is SOIC. Okay, the DIP or the dual inline package you, you can actually stick on a breadboard. That's what we will use. And there is what is called as a pinout diagram. So if you look on the chip next week in lab. There'll be a notch, and uh, this uh, the pin number next to the notch is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's how it goes, right? But the point I want to make is a not gate, this is the functionality of a not gate. You can extend it to n bits, okay? In this case, you have 6 bits. So let's see if I can copy this. I don't have my keyboard with me. So, um, basically, the, with the 74H04, you could have something like, for example, X5, X4, X3, X2, X1, X0. And notice something. I think your book starts numbering at 1. Subscript, I use 0. That's the standard. Okay, So, I'll always use 0. I won't start at 1. So, here's 6 bits. Okay? And the output is obviously Y5, Y4, Y3, Y2, Y1, Y0. So it's not necessary that 
all of these have to be zeros all of these have to be ones okay in the sense i could put this input 0 1 1 1 0 1 so what is the output let's say you pass it through a 7 4 h c 0 4 what's the output 1 0 0 0 1 0 yes but the fundamental truth table is this okay so we left so where we left off last time was we said if we have two input uh, digital logic functions we can have a total of two to the two to the two which is two to the four 16 possible functions okay we're going to look at a couple actually only one of them because after that we'll get into the whole transistors thing then we'll get back to this so let's look at one example so here is x1 x0 y0 0 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 these are the different possible input combinations yes so you can see how did i get 2 to the 2 to the 2 so for this 2 power 2 in the exponent tells you what are the different possible input combinations given the number of input bits okay so in other words this is your n or number of input bits okay in our case it's 2 so you have four possible combinations of input okay you have two input bits four possible combinations of it and for each combination you have two possibilities of the output right zero or one correct so you have zero two here two here two here two here in other words the total number of possibilities is two times two times two times two two to the four sixteen okay so if we have four input bits correct how many this is a question i can ask on the exam not the same question but a question related to it how many possible logic functions can i have so what's the answer so i have four input bits it's not 16 16 is the number of possible inputs i can have the answer is 2 to the 2 to the 4th, which is 2 to the 16. How much is this? Remember from last lecture? 65,536. A lot. Okay. So they grow exponent, exponential, exponent to the exponent. Right? So the fact that unlike um, f function on real variables, you have only a finite number of possible input combinations is not really a limiting factor. Okay? It doesn't really matter at all. All right, so let's look at, so you can have like y0 through y15, the sense I can have 0, 0, 0, 0, correct? All the way, like for example, to 1, 1, 1. So let's look at one particular function. So consider this function. Let me go to the next page. one x zero and I don't know let's call this y just y here's where it is okay so it's zero 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 one one zero one one zero one okay so this is called the logical and right the and function so y is the mathematical expression for this is x one a dot x zero okay Sometimes, so, I mean, I don't use the dot because it gets annoying and I just do that, right? And the reason why they use the dot is and is synonymous. It's not equivalent to multiplication. The sense 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 is 1. Okay. You could think about it like that, but it's not multiplication. Because in a few lectures, you will see the logical or, okay, which is not you'll have the plus symbol but it's not addition for sure okay 
So the schematic for this, the schematic symbol is like this. Sonic zero Y, okay? And just like um, the not gate, you can have uh, multiple input and gates, by the way. This is also called as a logic gate, sorry. Okay, GAT terminology. But practically speaking, they don't make, I've seen three input AND gates as chips. Four input is pretty rare. They, I don't think they made more than four input AND gates. I don't remember. Yeah. The most common is two input. But we're not going to be doing any uh, breadboarding, if you will, except for next lab. Okay. I mean, the first lab, sorry. Because that's kind of like been outdated. Now, if 10 years ago or like 14, year, well, yeah, 14 years ago, uh, in the late 90s, if you took digital logic, they were still breadboarding like a little bit in college. Okay, they were, but they were also moving towards FPGAs. Now it's, yeah. Okay, so it's late 20th century. It's all like it's. See, it's like when I, when I talk to my dad, right? Uh, my dad took calculus in like third year college. Now you take it in like high school, right? As like advanced placement or whatever. So that's what happens. Like all of it gets pushed. Uh, as knowledge becomes more and more, it gets start getting pushed away lower and lower. And one thing I have noticed is digital logic and eventually it'll go out of tech colleges as well. It's just the way it is. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the, let's before we discuss as to why actually breadboarding is important, let's look at an example. So let's see. Let's see what a three input AND function would look like, just out of curiosity. So x2, x1, x0, let's call this, I don't know, y3 something. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. These are all the different possible combinations of input. And note that the way I'm writing it is if you convert this to unsigned integer, this is 0, 1, 2. It's a standard way of writing it. You could put 1, 1, 1 here, but nobody does that, right? Like it's very, it's not systematic. Is that clear? So what would follow 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Recall from previous lectures, I told you you got to divide these into rows. And now since I have only eight possible input combinations, I'll be them in blocks of two. So do I have four blocks? One, two, three, four. Okay. So how do you find the AND function? Like how do you? So I want I want you to do say I, I'm going to define y3 as x2, x1, x0. So what is the AND function? Give me the output. What do you think it looks like? Okay, that's correct. And what about the rest? Zero. Okay, so how would you figure this out? Like, I mean, it's... Correct. So, it's, you actually used a mathematical property to figure this out. What is it? Not multiplication. Yes, what is it? Associativity. So basically what it is, you all probably said, okay, I can AND x1 and x0 first, and then AND it with x2. Yes? So in other words, it's, you basically said, again, visually, eventually I'll stop writing the visual schematic stuff, because as you will see, it gets, it involves a lot of writing, right? You're basically saying that this is equivalent to, this is equal to taking x1, x0, anding that, and then anding the result with x2, okay? So in other words, it doesn't matter this is equal to x2, x1, and x0, okay? doesn't matter in which order I do it. Is that clear? associated with you and unfortunately we'll just we're going to stop right here for digital logic okay, there are other functions there is or there is exclusive or we'll continue that only actually probably in week three right before break okay i think in the syllabus i don't have it with me i say like we start mosfets before break or transistors but for next week's lab you need 
the transistor stuff, and that's the most difficult part of the course. So I'll start that early. Okay. So we'll go with that. And let's see. So before we get into uh, trans, okay, let's actually let's get into transistors, and then um, get into. I want to get into delay propagation delay, but let's get into transistors first. But before we get into them, the natural question is how do we implement physically a logic gate? Okay, so how do we translate this picture into a physical circuit in our case, right? Because we're electrical engineers. So the answer, let us start with the simplest logic gate, which is what? What do you think is the simplest logic gate? Or logic function. I mean, don't give me like a simple output always zero, output always one. That doesn't help, right? Because it's just a wire, so that doesn't. For example, if the output is always one. Just hook it up to power supply, correct? So, what is the simplest logic gate we study? The not gate. Okay. So let us start with this fellow. X, Y. Okay. So basically, we need, so let us start with the knock. To implement not consider a switch. So it's kind of like a magic switch. That is, here is our switch S. Here is X, okay? So this is the symbol of our switch and the functionality is so if x equals 0 if x equals 1 you want to define what the switch does okay x equals 0 implies what what do you sorry okay but what do you think the switch does that's we are going to use the switch to build a not gate Switches off and switches on. So if x equals 0 switches off, physically what happens? Circuit opens, correct? So in other words, I'm going to draw this. So this is what happens to the switch. So this is switch. Then we'll use this to build a NOT gate. Right? x equals 1, it's closed. Two states of a switch. So let's build a NOT gate. So here is a NOT gate. So I put a power supply. Everybody familiar with this? Okay. What about this? You've seen this before? Power supply, right? So ground this. I have a little light bulb. This is the schematic of a light bulb. So I want to put the switch in here. Okay? So how, how would I? So let's say this is our Y. Okay? I have my little switch here. X. How do I hook this up? So in other words, let's do this. Here is A, let's be more clear, B, here is A, B, here is A, B, okay? And X controls this. So this is, so X equals 0, X equals 1, X controls the, like we discussed, the opening or closing of a switch, okay? So how do I hook this up here? You get not. So how? My thing just crashed. Hold on. Yes, because mine just crashed. So just stop, just stop, save. Okay, cool. Just ignore the title it gives automatically for the <laughs> document. It tries to guess what I wrote, and like it's so All right, so like this. Okay, so let's see if this works. So if x is 0, switch is open, the light bulb doesn't light up. If x is 1, it lights up. Okay? So this looks fine, but is there, can, like, is there any potential problems with this? 
is getting to starting to get you to think practically. Why do you need a resistor? So, if you assume resistance of light bulb is really small, okay, this implies, I don't know, let's call this VCC again. I'll tell you why it's called CC. Well, actually put this as VDD. You'll see VDD Y next week. This implies um, we could end up shorting VDD, right? I mean, not because the resistance is not zero. So how would you do this? So where would you put the resistor? So. What do you mean, parallel? So, okay, here's the resistor. Let's keep. And then, then what do you do? Aha, let's look at this one. Like this? What about this one? Okay, so why not? So let's go back to this. So this is one solution, right? Let's go, let's go to this one. So let's say I add, I do this. Ah, I can't draw the schematic of a light bulb anymore. Where did I ground this? I have no idea. X, there. there you go. So, which one would you use and why? What about the right one? Why doesn't it invert? Okay, so going back to this, does this work? No, it doesn't, right? So, good. So this doesn't work. You see why this doesn't work, right? So when X is zero, switch is open, correct? What's the output? Zero, right? When X is one, switch is closed. So it's basically, it doesn't do anything, right? Just a buffer. So I'm glad you guys saw it instead of me telling you. So this one also doesn't work. And let's go to this one. First of all, let's see if this one works. When X is zero, switch is open, correct? What's the, what do you want the output to be? One, right? So the light bulb lights up with, uh, neg with negligible drop across this resistor, right? you should get VDD here, okay? When X is one, okay, the switch is closed, right? This uh, light bulb, I mean, there's zero volts across the light bulb. So if you again define this as my output, there. so this looks good, okay? green it's too late okay so now let's go back then to what we we're talking about about needing that resistor I mean do you need this resistor do you will you really end up shorting VDD let's see let's take it out here see what happens so does this work if I take out that resistor, does it still work? So an X is zero, correct? 
switch is open, right? This gives one, this resistance is negligible, but at least there is some resistance, right? What happens when X is one? The switch is closed, so you should end up shorting the voltage source. So this doesn't work. So the solution for a NOT gate is this. Battery power do I have? I do have some amount left. Uh, open up. There. Okay. So solution for a NOT gate is this. Okay. And your book has information on AND gates and all that, but we're not gonna I'm not gonna ask you to do AND gates extra with these switches. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to start chapter three. So we're going to understand how to build our switch or S. Not how to build, how to, I'll put build in quotes, okay? Because we're not actually going to build a transistor. We're going to see how to use it. Okay, so this switch S, so I'm going to draw it like this. Let's see why. There are basically, initially it was done using relays. Okay, this was around 1950s. Okay, then came actually the bipolar junction transistor. This was 1960s to 70s. Oops, not 1700s, 70s. You would say early 70s. Okay. So BJT stands for well, bipolar junction transistor. Um, do you know the people, do you know the names of the folks who invented the transistor? There were three of them. So it's a little bit of transistor history. So first of all, what does transistor is an acronym, okay? What does it stand for? It's, you, can, you can expand this. It's a, anybody know what it stands for? It's an acronym. No, MOSFET is metal oxide something under field of a transistor, but the transistor itself is an acronym. It stands for transfer resistor. It's exactly what it is, right? A transistor is nothing more than a multi-terminal nonlinear resistor. It's a resistor. So, a little bit of transistor history. There were three guys who were primarily they're actually okay. I don't care. There are only two guys who are primarily responsible. Okay, it's Bardeen, Britton, Walter Britton, and Shockley. Okay. You might have heard of Shockley. Have you heard of Shockley? He was actually the manager. The guys who actually did the work were Britton and Bardeen. Okay. So they used to work for Bell Labs. And what they actually built first was the field effect transistor. It wasn't the bipolar transistor. But then at that time, you couldn't fab the field effect transistor, whatever. You know something about Bardeen? He, the, these guys won a Nobel Prize for this. Okay? Do you know that Bardeen also won another Nobel Prize? He's the only American, I think he's the only physicist to have won two Nobel Prizes, American. Yeah, it's for superconductivity. Bardeen, Cooper, and Schaefer, the BCS theory of superconductivity. Anybody watch the Big Bang Theory? So what do you recognize from here? Any? Cooper, he's named after this Cooper actually. Right. So Bardeen, Cooper, and Schaefer. So only guy to have one, uh, so this is BCS theory of superconductivity. So Bardeen had to come up with his own branch of physics called surface physics, right? Conductivity or surface chemistry, whatever. Right. So uh, Nobel Prize. So Bardeen, same guy. Okay. So the transistor has like a fascinating history. You should look into it. But basically, all it is is the transfer resistor. So what we are going to study, we are going to study 
what is called as a MOS FET. So this stands for metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So the reason why I've written it like this is because each of these words has a meaning. right? So and you will understand that by looking at so let's look at the properties of a transistor. Here is the schematic symbol. Like this. Okay. So basically, um, what does this symbol remind you of? Does anybody, most of you haven't taken 2060 yet. It's a capacitor. Okay. So what a transistor basically is it's a metal sandwiched sorry metal here is the semiconductor okay sandwiched between the metal and the semiconductor don't worry about what a semiconductor actually is it's an oxide layer okay. so it is a capacitor so that's where the term metal oxide semiconductor comes from and the transistor action is due to field effect so what do you mean by field effect let's say i put a voltage I'm going to call this VG. And you'll see why I call it VG. Right? So positive charges accumulate here. Okay. So the system was electrically neutral. So the oxide is an insulator. So what do you think happens here? The negative charges get induced here. But now what happens with the semiconductor is, let's say you put a voltage here, VDD, and then you ground this. Let's just call this VSS, OK? Current can now flow from drain to source, OK? In other words, this is called as, this terminal is called as the gate of the MOSFET. It's like it controls, you have to put a voltage on the gate above a specific value called as a threshold voltage for the, you have to deposit positive charges, okay? So every transistor has a turn on voltage called as a threshold voltage. Again, I'm just talking about MOSFETs, okay? I'm not talking about BJTs, forget BJTs, right? You cannot apply this theory to BJTs, it doesn't work, right? don't even try. It's completely different physics. So there are two main kinds. There are many varieties of transistors. We are actually, technically speaking, we are talking, up, talking about n-channel enhancement mode metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. For us, it's a transistor. So you put positive charges here. You get negative charges induced. Now, you can't do anything here unless you put a what is called as a VDS here, drain to source. Okay. So let me use different colors. This can get, get confusing very quickly. This is called the drain. This is called the source. Because source is like a source of electrons, right? So the electron starts flowing this way once you put a voltage difference from the source, like a tap, to the drain, okay? But current, remember by our convention, flows opposite to the direction of electrons. Yes? So current starts flowing. But the beauty of this metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor is at steady state, how much current do you think flows in here? Huh? Zero very little why? Why? There's an oxide here, right? So unlike the bipolar transistor, no current flows here at DC. So you have a perfect like switch. Right, in the sense, current flows here, but this part is insulated. Right? So when, the, when these transistors came out, when they figured out how to fab them in the 70s, just exploded. Right? But the problem is this current is not zero. Okay? It's like nanoamps, picoamps. Okay, let's say picoamps, three hours of magnets more. But yeah, who cares? Just picoamps. But if you have a billion of these guys on a chip, you do care. Right? It all adds up. But the bottom line is the steady state power dissipation of MOSFETs 
that is when all the transients have died out is almost zero very attractive so this is exactly what we want right in the sense let's look at a cleaner schematic that is let's say this is my a this is my b correct this is my x can't i just map this to the switch x is 0 volts it's off correct x is 1 it's on boom right perfect okay all right so let's again let me redo the terminology here this is gate this is drain this is source okay now let me ask you this can i make this the drain that is b the drain and D the source. Can I do that theoretically? Theoretically, yes, you can. But unfortunately, there's a problem, right? In the sense, there is another terminal of a transistor called the base or the bulk. And it's basically this little semiconductor here. And usually, within the transistor itself, this bulk is hooked up to the source. So you, 99.99% of practical transistors have only three terminals, okay? The drain, the gate, and the source. So the drain and the source are not reversible. If you try to reverse this, you'll end up destroying the transistor. Because the bulk is always hooked up to the source. Yeah. Just the way it is. And it's only true for the kind of transistor we're talking about right now, which is the N MOSFET. This is called, so let me throw this terminology, it's called as an N MOS. FET, I'll put FET within brackets because I'll eventually drop it out. It will be called NMOS because the majority carriers are electrons. Okay. N for electrons. Okay? We'll get into the PMOS on Monday. It's another kind of transistor. It's very important for us. But first, hey, we were able to get a NOT gate out of resistor and switch, right? So why don't we translate this fellow to our transistor circuit? So, here is what is called as RTL. This is resistor transistor logic. There is another thing, there is another abbreviation for RTL we'll see later in the course called register transfer level. That's, that has nothing to do with this. Okay? It's logic based off of resistors and transistors. This came about in the 1970s and was quickly outdated by the late 1970s. Right? But let's start with this. After RTL came DTL. What do you think DTL stands for? What is a circuit element that has that starts with D? Diode. Yeah, it's called diode transistor logic. Next week, we're going to jump into what is called, well, TTL, transistor transistor logic, is actually bipolar logic, right? BJT. It's not MOSFETs, what we're doing. MOSFET is CMOS. So, see the 74 HC04, okay? HC stands for high-speed CMOS. Have you heard of 74 LS? Have you seen LS? LS is low power shot key. Okay, so it's a lot of things were around. All, all of that is like gone. Yeah. But we need to understand it because at the fundamental level, FPG is our guess what? Yeah, this. Yeah. So all right, let's make not key. Let's start with that. Okay. Let's try this. Now you gotta get this again. This is the most difficult part of the course, right? And you have to practice this. This looks simple, but it is if you understand this. Okay. VDD. Now you know why the power supply is called VDD, or you can infer why, because current always flows from drain to source. Okay, so VDD is the highest voltage in the circuit. Okay. You might have seen uh, VCC and VEE. Have you seen this somewhere in schematics? This is bipolar transistors. Okay, The bipolar terminal for drain is called collector. For source is called emitter. Okay. That's where all this terminology comes from. Right. You might have seen on op amp data sheets, VCC, VEE. So it's all transistor terminology. But anyway, we're not going to use VCC, VEE because we're using MOSFETs. Yeah. All right. I'm going to make this my X and make this my Y. Okay. You will always forget this. Don't forget this. Step one, let me put this in red, is identify step zero. Very important. Okay. 
identify gate drain and source terminal effect most important people forget this and i have no idea why okay so the gate is very easy where's the gate Where is the drain and where is the source? Huh? Nah, no, be careful. The drain, that's a it's a common mistake. It's good we're making these mistakes. The, the why is the drain? Okay? Because the drain is always associated with the transistor. Okay? This is called VDD because it's pulled up, the drain is pulled up to the power supply. Right? But this is not the drain. Is that clear? Where is the source? Okay. That's step zero. Always do this first. Okay. I'll get more opportunities to do this. Okay. I guess step one is figure out which transistor is on. And which is off. Okay. MOSFETs are usually abbreviated in a schematic with an M and a 1. BJTs, they go with like Q and that's how it is, right? Usually. So you got to figure out which transistor is on and which is off, right? Obviously, within brackets for appropriate, I mean, this is so obvious, I don't have to write this, but I'll write it for appropriate input values. Okay, so what happens? So, in other words, let's look at our X. But remember, what did I tell you about the transistor? Okay, the transistor, I told you, I didn't tell you this. I told you the voltage at the gate is what determines it. That's actually not true. Okay, what determines if the transistor is on or off is this voltage. VGS, the gate to source voltage. Okay? Remember that. VGS is what determines if it's on or off. And you will see why this is important later. Okay? In this case, how is our X related to VGS? So, in other words, to be more specific, let me draw out the schematic. This is what I mean. Okay? X is the node voltage. So, there it is. Okay? My shorthand abbreviation. What is the relationship between X and VGS? No, what is the relation between this voltage X and VGS? They're the same, they're equal. Okay? Okay? X is equal to VGS in this circuit. Is that clear? What happens if I put a resistor here? Here, right here. Steady state, what happens? It should still be equal. There's no current in here, remember? What happens if I put like a diode here to ground? So let me, let's do a little quick. Let's see what happens if I, okay, forget diode, right? Since you guys haven't seen diodes. I don't know. Put a resistor here. Let me do this. VDD, okay? Where is the source terminal of the transistor now? So, yeah, it's right here. Okay, oops, it's not X, that's source. I'm excited. Is that clear? Here is the R. Let me put the R down there. Here is the drain. I'm not going to mark any voltages. There you go, mine crashed again. Windows, Windows, Windows. All right, there. Let me erase this. Here's drain, here's gate. Okay, so in this case, X is not equal to VGS. Just remember that. Right? It's just basic circuits. Be careful. Okay, but now in our, now you know why we moved the resistor up here. Because X will become equal to VGS. These two elements are in series, right? Because remember, the transistor is a multi-terminal device. It's got one, two, 
three terminals, drain gate source, right? Resistor is only two terminal, but it doesn't matter. This is the current is going to flow like this. There is no current in here, right? The current through the resistor is the same as the current through the drain to source. They're in series, right? Remember 2050? Elements in series have the same current flowing through them. Same thing here. But this is attractive because whatever input voltage I put in onto the gate becomes my VGS. Make sense? So as a circuit designer in the 70s, this is the choice they made. There are reasons why they made choices. And this is the reason. Okay. All right. Now, does this become an inverter? So what are the values of X we substitute? What values of X? Zero and one. So let's make one equal to VDD, okay, the power supply. So when X is zero, VGS is zero, how is the transistor acting? So let's look at that and stop. Okay. When X equals zero, the transistor is what? Sorry? How is what is the transistor doing? It's open, it's off, okay? So what I'm gonna do is x equals zero, so let me do this. So this is zero. Here is the gate. Here is the drain. Here is the resistor. Here is VDD, okay? The drain. Transistor is open, nothing going on there, okay? Here's my Y. What's Y in this circuit? VDD, right? So it's 1, which is equal to VDD, which I already told you. Okay? So this is x equals 0. Let me just write it out like this way. So what happens when x equals 1? If I tell you the transistor is on, what do you think I replace the transistor with? No. So x equals 1, I tell you transistor is on. Yeah, I replace it with a short circuit, right? When the transistor is on, it's basically not dropping any voltage. Okay? And we'll look at the analog models next week. They are important, okay? Because we need them to understand propagation delay. Right? Now, what is Y? Again, identify, oh, it's telling me to quit. Almost time. Drain source. What's Y? Zero, correct? Is this an inverter? Yeah, it's awesome. All right, so perfect. Now, what's the problem with this? So this is where we'll start for the next lecture. But what, what, what is the issue you see with this? So I'll, okay, it's hard, I'll tell you. It's power, okay? How much power is dissipated here, ideally? No, you can tell me exactly what it is. Always use VI, right? Power is always VI. Because your I squared R or like V squared over R will not work for this guaranteed transistor, okay? So you can define a lot of powers, right? Okay, well, I mean, in the sense, what, what voltage do I pick? Do I pick VGS? Do I pick VDS? For the FET, the VGS doesn't matter because this current is zero, right, ideally? So the power for a transistor, for a MOSFET, We'll define the power for a FET as VDS times IDS, okay? In other words, here is the picture. So here is drain source plus or minus VDS times IDS. Again, following the passive sign convention, okay? It's a definition. VI. What's the power here? Zero. No power. Great, right? What about this fellow? What? So what is the power associated ideally with the effect? Ideally. What's VDS? Zero, right? So what's the power associated with the effect? Zero. Practically, it's very little. What about this fellow? Is that zero power? No. Like, yeah, uh, who, who cares, right? Yeah, you will care when you have like a million of these on the chip. So, what we would like, ideally, we want 
or to turn off when M1 is on. Correct? Because this is fine. Yeah? This one is the problem, right? When this guy is on, if this guy turns off, be great. Answer, PMOS. Okay? A transistor that turns on when it's zero, when the input is zero, and off when the input is one. Complementary to NMOS. When you have a PMOS and NMOS together on a chip, it's called CMOS. That's what it is. That's what we'll start on. So we'll start with this magic, it's not a magical device. It's a device which is the complement of the NMOS, the PMOS. So this R is the PMOS. Yeah, we'll talk about it next week.